Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Can human psychic power overcome alien power in an abduction situation? What are the night crawlers? Why don't the Enos believe in disembodied spirits, or do they? Well, hello there, and welcome to the 425th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and those many varied questions came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. Now, I know that many people were looking forward to our show on the paranormal lives of the saints this evening, but because Ben is with me in studio this evening, a real treat, we decided to bump that show until one month from today, March 18th, and do an impromptu open line show instead, because uh, that's well, I think we're at our best when we're talking to each other about these emails, and also yeah. because a lot of people have expressed interest in the recent meteoric incidents that have occurred over the past week or so. You can also thank George Washington for me being here today. Yes, indeed, and Lincoln. Presumably, well, today is actually George Washington's birthday. Indeed, they, just, they just sort of lumped everything together. So thank George Washington for being born today. So thank you, I, George. Okay. Uh, so we will do a contest question, now that we have Ben's able assistance. That's difficult when I'm by myself or with another producer, but anyway. Alrighty. So this week's contest question is, uh, lake monsters are most commonly associated with what animal? So nail that and win a copy of... Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny, my dad's most recent book. Well, there's the question, and for the first and last time on this show, we're going to do a local birthday. Now, uh, that's because it is my lovely wife and uh, Ben's lovely mother, who is uh, going to be turning uh, 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 today, uh, I should say Thursday, and we are going to have, um, uh, just uh, wanted to wish her a very happy birthday if she's listening in. And if she is, we'll probably get in trouble for mentioning it. But in any case, uh, we hope that uh, one interesting person especially is going to call in this evening, and uh, that is uh, David Stevens, one of our recent guests, uh, former Navy commander, and uh, pilot of the, I believe it was the F- 18 or 14, well, anyway. What I, I can't recall. Yeah, one of the uh, naval, uh, uh, famous naval fighting planes, fighters. And, one uh, of author, those things. One of those things with wings. And uh, author of the Resurrect series of books. Uh, and we're going to get, get his take on the recent meteor airburst that injured over a 1,000 people in Russia and on the near miss of this planet by an asteroid this past week uh, or a little bit before that. Sort of and, like Tunguska. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, we'll get sure. into that. Yeah. And uh, you remember... Uh, David uh, Stevens, of course, has a very interesting guest who was uh, lining up various scenarios for it, sort of the, uh, I suppose, end of the world, as you might say, or at least serious uh, dent in the planet kind of kind yeah, of scenarios. Seri- yeah, yeah, serious dent in the population sort of thing. Yeah, so uh, David should be calling in very soon. So anyway, in the meantime, let's uh, let's get to our emails. And uh, <clears throat> again, March 18th, we will do Paranormal Lives of the Saints. Uh, this is from Lori. This is not to use a full name, in Newington, Connecticut. Alrighty, so uh, Lori writes to us, Hi Paul and Ben, I know you tell people not to use Ouija boards, uh, or should I say Ouija or Ouija? I always said Ouija. Ouija, that's how it's generally. Yeah, uh, I figured. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, let's start over again. So hi Paul and Ben, I know you tell people not to use Ouija boards, but I was at a friend's during uh, Christmas vacation in January and she got one for Christmas. We used it, and it said that there would be a big meteor last week, and it said it would be over Russia. If Ouija boards are fake or dangerous, why was this prophecy right? Well, just because it's not dangerous doesn't mean it can't be right. (laughs) Well, that's it. Uh, I've always thought the name Ouija, or Ouija, as you pronounce it, if you pronounce it the way it looks, we, French for yes, ya, German for yes. However, I would say no nine instead. No, don't do it. But to answer Laurie's question... We have an issue of what here? Uh, okay, all right. I will give you an example of why you should not do this. We didn't just because it's dangerous doesn't mean, as Ben says, that that it's wrong. Remember, what are you dealing with here? Most likely, you're dealing with uh, entities that we refer to as parasites, who are not what they claim to be. Although I suppose it is possible that they could be what they claim to be, but it's not worth taking the chance. You stand on the highway. Maybe you'll get hit, maybe you won't, but generally you do. And these entities will say things and do things that make you believe they're what they say they are and that will feed them, and they, that's why they do this. They're, these are not ghosts or spirits. or anything. These are life forms that feed upon energy, just like anything in nature has to feed, so do they. That's what we've run into over the past 40 years. So I would say that uh, I'll give you an example of what happened 
to me once using one of these things. I was uh, young and foolish and silly, and, and I think it was in sixth grade. And a neighbor kid of ours in Connecticut, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, received one of these things for uh, his birthday. And we sat down one uh, fall day in, uh, I believe it was 1966 or something like that, and we began to use it. We uh, got all kinds of interesting answers from the thing. And as you know, with these things, it, it's, it's, a, it's a board, like about the same size as a, as a Monopoly board, I guess. And it's got letters and numbers, and you have what's called a planchette. And you put your fingers on it, and it's, it moves around, uh, supposedly of its own volition, and it will spell words and give you numbers. So we asked eventually when we would die. And a lot of people ask things, maybe you don't want to know. But it said that he would die in 1985, which even from, from that perspective was a long way off. And he did die in 1985. He was killed in a diving accident, ironically, in Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, where you know, we didn't even live then. And uh, that was that. Uh, it said I have uh, you know, a couple more years to go myself into the well into the 21st century here, so I didn't think much about that either. But I remember that when I read his obituary, and that, that came right, right roaring back into my mind. Why could these sometimes be accurate? Well, these entities, remember, they, they live by moving back and forth, I believe, we believe, among parallel worlds, among parallel realities. I have seen them in certain cases with their, uh, figuratively speaking anyway, tentacles reaching into several different worlds at once, bothering the whoever lives there, trying to feed off them. Weird as it may sound, that's what I've run into. Uh, I don't find them to be servants of Satan or demons or anything like that. I find, them, I find that that's what our folklore makes of them because we don't understand quantum mechanics, at least certainly not then. So that they, they have seen worlds and they're in touch with the worlds where those things really do happen. And so sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not right. That's the same reason sometimes psychics are right when they predict the future and sometimes they're not because they're in touch with uh, the, these realities uh, that may be real in some other parallel world, but not in our own. That's how I read that. And so that's why this thing took a shot and got it right about how my friend would die. So I would say, do not use these things. It's not worth it. It's just, um, it's, it's just, just Im Im impossible to, to guarantee your safety and it, it's not worth it. There are better ways to live your life and to find things out. So that's how I would, uh, certainly answer Lori's question. Um, and again, are they fake or dangerous? Probably not fake, but certainly dangerous. These are among what I call the sledgehammer techniques for trying to break uh, through the walls of other worlds and find things out that you probably are better off not knowing anyway, and that might not be true in this world anyhow. So there we are. Okay, uh, I, I guess we have... Uh, okay, here's one. This is from um, Mike. uh doesn't want us to use the name either. Mike in Hempstead, Long Island. Alrighty, so Mike writes to us. Hi guys, I uh, love your show, especially when you talk about destruction scenarios. Oh, well, that's positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that's weird, but I find it fascinating. Uh, I was wondering what happens to victims of mass destruction scenarios. Uh, do they all end up like that guy in the stone church, uh, confused until they get back the memory of that life? Okay, yeah, uh, it requires a little bit of explanation. Thank you, Mike, for writing. Uh, we uh, hope you did okay on the storms there in Long Island. Well, in case anybody hasn't heard this story before, I mean, we've well, mentioned it yeah. numerous times in the air. Why don't you reiterate? Well, just very briefly, uh, my experience uh, on several occasions has been with uh, people People thought their, their places were haunted and that they were being bothered by ghosts and there were sounds and different things. And my experience when I, when I was able to communicate, and that's another long story, I don't suggest people do that, and I don't try to do it, but sometimes it happens, was that, that if I was reading it properly, and if sometimes these were in, in languages other than, other than English, although this one was in English, uh, people had, were apparently caught between parallel lives. That's why I started to, to really suspect very strongly that when we die, quote unquote, which is something I don't really even believe in, we um, the the outer shell, or if you will, your body, which I think is a very important part of us, might pass away like a leaf falling off a tree. But you're not just the leaf; you're the whole tree, 
and on that tree are many different leaves and in in your in our lives really our lives together there are many different lives many different leaves many different bodies if you will and uh, what i was encountering on several occasions were people in the process of shifting their consciousness from where they were to where they already already were in parallel lives <clears throat> The lives we're living here seem to be um, what we think is it, but in our whole subconscious, our lives that we are living elsewhere and elsewhere in the multiverse, different times, different places, different years, different species, you name it, it's all, it's all there. Uh, and, in, and the issue of the um, uh, other lives, if we're living them there, the life we're living here is part of our subconscious. That's, that's what I believe. So I think that when a destruction scenario occurs like this, and uh, millions, I suppose, die in this. It doesn't make any difference from that point of view because everyone, as we say, kind of makes their own bed in the multiverse. Uh, the particular fellow in this stone church in Virginia that, that Mike is referring to in his email uh, was just one example uh, because by the end of the conversation, he had completely forgotten what had gone before and realized that he was uh, just going through his day in this parallel life, apparently. And that's what I think happens uh, pretty much to to all of us. And someone wrote in last week about, well, what about the tunnel thing? What about the, the near-death experience business? Well, again, that's a near-death experience, not a death experience, because otherwise they'd be dead, whatever that may mean. So I think that it, it's very personal to all of us. Not everyone has the same experience, contrary to popular belief, and this is just one example here. So thank you for writing in, Mike. And we have David Stevens on the line, I believe. David, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, very good. Uh, glad you could call in. Okay, a lot of people, uh, we bumped uh, the subject of this show to some other date because people were so interested in this meteor and uh, the, the two different situations. Uh, tell us, what uh, what caused all this damage in Russia? It was an airburst, I understand, of a meteor. How wide? Uh, they updated it. It was 50. Now they're saying about 55 feet wide. 55 uh, feet out. wide. That yeah. doesn't sound very big. No, um, it's about the size of a house. Okay. So what happened? You run a, uh, when you run something through the atmosphere at 40,000 miles an hour, um, it, it uh, superheats, and they believe it was about a 500 kiloton blast. That's about 20 times more than Hiroshima. Wow. Suppose this thing had been 150 feet wide. It would have been the same as Tunguska. It would have flattened everything in about 1,000 square miles. Funny you bring that up. We were just about to ask that. Yeah, man. <laughs> in 1908, uh, just to fill anybody who doesn't know, uh, Tunguska, an area of Siberia, uh, what appears to be something similar to this occurred, and a large, uh, probably perhaps meteorite. I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let David uh, tell the tell the story. Yeah, it, w it was probably very similar to the one that uh, whizzed by us at uh, almost the same time, within okay. hours, it was about 100, 150 meters, or excuse me, 150 feet across. Okay, and, and it, it exploded at great speed through the atmosphere, and it leveled an area, what was, I believe it was about 200 square miles? Yeah, they're, they say actually damaged probably closer to 850 square miles. Wow. And that's an air blast. It, uh, it never struck the ground, or at least only pieces of it struck the ground. Would it have been better if it had struck the ground, as far well, as the, 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 the amount of damage? The um, Part of it is what it's composed of. Uh, there's one in Arizona that was probably close to the same size, it, but it was composed of, of iron, and it did strike the ground. And, of course, everybody's seen Meteor Crater. Yeah, Meteor Crater. Uh, I believe it's a national park, as a matter of fact. Exactly. Yeah, that's ironic. Uh, would, uh, what, what would you say – I don't know. About what, what, uh, what about the one that passed us by that was, as you say, about 150 feet wide? Yeah, that was, um, that was pretty wild. It, it came within about 17,000 miles. That's a hair's breadth, isn't it? It is in astronomical terms. It came inside of the orbit of your, your dish or direct TV satellite. Wow. <laughs> so it was pretty close. It could have potentially taken one of those out if it just happened to be in the, the same spot. What, what strikes me, though, and... and um, That's a strange way to put it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that uh, those two events happened almost at the same time. And, you know, you think, well, my first thought was, well, they probably broke off the same piece of rock. You know, they were flying in formation. You know, no big deal. But now, <laughs> Where's the rest of the rock? Yeah, that, that's another question. But they ran the trajectories and actually came from completely different points of the sky. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other, which brings up the next question, and that is, what is the probability that two objects like that that are uh, supposed to be basically once-in-a-lifetime events 
happened at the same day. Wow. What is the probability? About the same as uh, walking into a, a party and everybody in the room having the exact same birthday as yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's oh, not- my goodness. So... Uh, yeah, those who did not hear the show we did with with uh, David was it was a matter of a very interesting discussion about uh, what was it eight or nine different scenarios. It was ten. Ten different Top scenarios, 10. right? So, but before we get into that, we do have a caller, and uh, Dave, if you'd stand by, we'll uh, take our caller. Hold on. Sure. Okay. Come on. There we go. Okay. Welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Hey, how you guys doing? This is Jim Williams. Oh, how, oh, how you doing, doing, Jim? I'm doing fine. It's cold up here in Maine. Um, intrigued about this asteroid. It's cold down here in Rhode Island, too. <laughs> uh, it's a lot colder up here, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm sure it is. So that thing was over 55 feet. That's a, yeah, about the size of a house. And I, I posted that video. I, I don't know if you saw it, uh, Paul, uh, of the sound that it made. Did I did. It? Yes, I did see that. And um, it, I, I, not, that's a good question to ask uh, ask David here, too, about the sound. You know what? I've heard, uh, David, th- that when you hear a media, right, which is, as I understand it, is usually a sizzling sound. Uh, it's within 30 miles. Is that correct? That's probably true. Um, when I I was an F-18 pilot, and we used to break the sound barrier about 1.5 Mach, so it's about 900 miles an hour, um, in a 20-ton streamlined jet. Now imagine a, uh, a house-shaped, non-streamlined rock doing <laughs> Mach 40. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's about right. Now, go ahead, Jim. My uh, my curiosity though, because it, it, at first I thought, you know, this is this a coincidence or is this part of a, a bigger meteor shower that we're going to get? Uh, that, in that video, that you know, you can hear the glass breaking uh, for for miles around. It sounded like a big glass factory being crushed, and then the car alarms going off. My, uh, my see if uh, see if you, your guests can uh, come up with a scenario on this. What would have happened if the big one, the one that passed seventeen thousand miles, what would have happened to us if that came down? David. That would be bad. Um, if it came down over a, a metropolitan area like Los Angeles or New York, it would basically flatten the city. Um, there, there's enough energy there. I mean, we're talking about a 5 to 10 megaton blast. Um, the biggest nuclear weapons I ever carried were, were smaller than that. So uh, it would be devastating, absolutely devastating. What, what about Rhode Island? Let's say, okay, Paul and Ben, you're up in Rhode Island, right? You're in Woodstock. What happens if it hit in Providence? What would happen to Paul and Ben? <laughs> oh, God, I don't even want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a basement? Uh, that, <laughs> better be a strong basement. That was amazing, though. That's why, one of the reasons why I'm listening and calling in tonight, because I was watching some of the videos. One guy was driving down the uh, down the street, going to work, I guess, and it just came out of the sky. And the first thing I thought was, that is fake. I, I didn't really know the news at the time, but somebody said, hey, Jim, look at this video. And I see this fireball coming down the sky with a big contrail, and I thought it was a movie scene. It looked like a movie scene. I was like, this is fake. This can't be real. Yeah, you never know with YouTube, but uh, no, I, I, I did some research and it's it's legit. I'm mm-hmm. sure, uh, David. I'm sure you've seen those those videos. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And the 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 point that I I probably make that um, you know a lot of people look at this and they say, well, if it if it you know came from a cloud of the same debris, that's one thing. But do you understand if if this is truly two objects coming from different directions? Um, that suggests that our model of how many objects are out there is probably wrong. The statistical probability of this happening is so tiny. Let me like, just a, a real quick example: um, Shoemaker-Levy comet that struck Jupiter back in 1994. Everybody said that was a once-in-a-lifetime thing to see a, a giant comet strike the surface of Jupiter. Since that has happened, we've seen Jupiter get struck in 19, uh, excuse me, 2009, 10, 11, and 12. So we've had five. Lifetime events occur in a fairly short period of time. Um, I think this is a warning shot. It's telling us that our, our estimates, our, our uh, predictions of how often we get strike uh, struck are probably off by a hundred or a thousand fold. But who's mm-hmm. it, who was it that said that we were in a cosmic shooting gallery? I can't remember who. I don't know, but whoever was it were right. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably Joe Faria. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Could <maybe>. be. <laughs> yeah, he'd have been all over this. Oh, he would be. He would. You were right. Yeah, Joe Ferrier is a local guy on our station, uh, David, who was a um, uh, local legend, local legend, local legend. A paranormal aficionado for for decades and decades. But he would he would have been all over this. He passed away unfortunately uh, last year. Yeah, God rest him. Yeah, amen. So, uh, in any case, uh, so uh, we are in a shooting gallery there. And uh, David, would you say that? Uh, and I've heard that Jupiter does a lot to protect us to some degree from some of this. Is that true? Absolutely, it's got a giant gravitational field. So. It tends to suck in a lot of debris that would normally hit us. In fact, 
um, we would probably be reeling from mass extinctions every couple million years if it wasn't for Jupiter. Wow. So what do we do about all this? Well, first of all, we have to identify the fact that, that we are at threat, um, that there is a, you know, and uh, as we discussed before, one of the purposes of, of my writing a, a techno thriller, or writing Resurrect, was, was public awareness. Um, and I'm donating a uh, percentage to B612 Foundation, which is uh, uh, run by former astronaut Dr. Ed Liu, who obviously right now he's a very popular man. Um, yeah. His mission is to try to put up a, a telescope that can find. Um, we've only found about 9,600 Earth-crossing asteroids, but it's estimated by NASA that there are over a million out there. Wow. My question is, if we spot one coming towards the Earth, what would we do about it? There's there several things we can do. I mean, you know, in the movies, of course, they always hit it with a nuclear weapon. Um, that's generally not the best uh, alternative just because it could turn one giant rock into a bunch of buckshot. Uh, although if you could get close to it and just use the heat of the uh, of the uh, detonation, or excuse me, the uh, the radiation of the detonation, um, you could actually give it a, a tiny push. But that those those sorts of, of processes only work if we can find it 15, 20 years before impact. If it's no kidding barreling down on us within a year, we're probably toast. Um, and that's why it's so critical to, to be able to find these. And we haven't even talked about comets, which could be a, a thousand times greater threat. How much of the sky do we actually watch? Well, we can't we can't see around the sun very easily, so that side is a is, you know we're kind of blind to. Um, Doctor Ed Liu's uh, proposal is to put up a, a telescope, an, uh, an infrared telescope, it would basically be in its own orbit, uh, orbiting the sun just like the Earth is, and that would give it a clear clear view of of the skies and be able to eventually, within a few years, pretty much map all the asteroids. But there's also the problem of Earth's atmosphere, because I, I have a very broad knowledge of astronomy, thanks to an astronomy course I took <laughs> at the, my former college. And um, one of the big problems of astronomy uh, is, well, observations at least, is the atmosphere that kind of ruin – it doesn't ruin it, but it, it makes things look shaky and it makes things kind of inaccurate. I mean the Hubble was put up there, but the Hubble is – there's a crack in it, and that doesn't make it that helpful. So <laughs> there's a lot of things against us here. When the crack in that? I couldn't hear that. Oh yeah, there's been a crack in it for a while since it went up. I thought they went out and fixed it. I don't know. From what I from what I remember, it's still there. Like the crack is still in it. Oh, I didn't know that. Either. Yeah, isn't there? And I believe there's another uh, orbiting telescope as well. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, David, do you happen to know? Yeah, there's the white. And what they did is, they, they, I think they put corrective optics into into the Hubble and then eventually replaced the the bad mirror, but. But you're absolutely right. You have to get a telescope outside of the atmosphere, um, particularly with infrared. Um, objects like comets and asteroids, they're not real bright. In fact, you know, a lot of comets, they believe mm -hmm. in that may be pitch black. So you, you can only see them by the tiny amount of heat they generate. Well, infrared telescopes do not work well in the atmosphere because the atmosphere tends to absorb that frequency. So you're right. You've got, it's good to get them out for optical. It's critical to get them out for infrared. What is the chance that a large object, say 150 feet wide, such as the one that passed us by, were to strike uh, water? What, 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 what chance is there that it would strike land as opposed to water? Because you know, most of the planet seems to be water, actually. <clears throat> the chances are actually, you're right, much higher that it will hit the water. Um, NASA says that a Tunguska-sized event, or the same as the one that, that just missed us, is about a 1,200-year uh, uh, probability. Hmm. Uh, some some recent research by Dr. Bill Napier and others, and and looking at the statistics of what we've just happened, suggested maybe more like a hundred year event, not a thousand year event. If it did strike the water, and probably many have, and we've been unaware of them, mm -hmm. um, it would create a tsunami, a fairly significant tsunami. Yeah, as we sit here on the east coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would, yeah, it would make the one in Japan look like a look like a little swimming in the pond. Yeah, speaking of YouTube, if you look at some of the videos of, <clears throat> of that event, it's really frightening. And, oh, and that's yeah. a okay. lot of tsunamis that have struck uh, in the past, especially before we had you know, modern technology, satellites, etc., may have been from a meteor. We just never knew it because uh, there was nobody to observe it striking the ocean. What would be the difference between an asteroid strike or meteor strike and a, and a comet? Which is, uh, I, I believe, has, has a, a solid core, but is mostly ice. Or, I don't know. Maybe Ben knows more about it than I do. I honestly can't remember. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I, I think w- I think one means is you're going to uh, you're going to have to reschedule an appointment, and the comet means you're going to miss your appointment forever. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I see. Okay, something <laughs> like that. You best you should probably reschedule. Yeah, exactly. Well, David, uh, we're going to take a break shortly, but why don't you tell us to take the moment now to tell us about your books and uh, where people can find out more about you, David Stevens. All right, well, I'm going to take off. You guys take care. All right, thank you, Jim. Right, thanks, Jim. All right, okay. you have a good one. You thank too. You. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Resurrect, it's a trilogy. It's out on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, published by uh, Lion, uh, Lion Hudson. Um, y- y- we just... Uh, we're pretty excited. We're running about 4.7 stars out of five on on Amazon. Great. Uh, it's uh, it was optioned for a movie, um, and we're pretty excited about that. Uh, the next one out of the trilogy will be out shortly. But they're based on the top three apocalyptic threats facing humanity, uh, basically turned into an, an action adventure. And uh, the number one threat, sure enough, uh, people blamed me. They actually accused me of uh, of uh, causing the media in Russia. <laughs> in they never know what's going to happen in Russia. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that's outstanding. Uh, now, David, tell us, uh, w- if you remind us again, what are the ten scenarios in order that you have identified? The, uh, you, know, uh, do you want me to start from the, the top or, or move from the bottom? Yeah, well, it's just, well, well okay, uh, I guess it's more exciting if you start from the bottom. What yeah. is the least likely? Okay, that, I don't have all of them in front of me right now, but okay. um, the... And re- really, I, I, I narrowed it down to about eight, because uh, beyond that, you start running into a situation where the probability is pretty small. Okay. Um, solar storms, um, super volcanoes, um, nuclear and biological war. I think that's probably not unexpected. Um, there's something called a uh, gamma ray burst. Mm-hmm. Uh, and finally, uh, we get up into the, the top few, which really would be nuclear war, artificial intelligence, and finally asteroids and comets. Very good. Well, not very good, but you know, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess, uh, Ben, you have any uh, further questions for uh, for David before we move on? I do not, because we do have to go to a break. We do. David, thank you very much for calling in. David Stevens, everybody, check out his books. It's terrific stuff. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Thank you, care. too. We'll be talking to you. Okay, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on yeah, WON 1240 AM in New England's beautiful but chilly Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back. Lou Mandeville here to tell you the only place to get your local high school and college scores, as well as the Pats, Bruins, Celtics, and Sox is on my morning sports reports. And they are right here on ON 1240, Monday through Friday on the Morning Fun Show. And we're back behind the paranormal with Paul and Benino right here on WON 1240 AM radio. And uh, so that was interesting. Terrifying, but interesting. Indeed. What the heck just happened? All right. Well, well, we went to a break, and then we came back from the break. We did. Okay. Quick break. I missed that one. That's what... Nah. Okay. Well, I, ca- we... I kind of gave you a one-second warning. That wasn't really fair. Thank you. They do the better than that in football. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ben. Anyway, uh, we have one... Uh, let's continue with our emails here. We have one from Julie in Mansfield, Massachusetts, right in our listening area. All righty. So Julie writes to us. Hello, Paul and Ben. I am interested in... Uh, Seeing what guests will have to have on from week uh, week to week. Sorry, my English is breaking down. Uh, I I like some more. I, I like some guests more than others. Um, but you sure reach the whole spectrum. I do I do not know how you keep your temper with some of them. Uh, there <laughs> are there are an awful lot of narrow minded and downright stupid people in this field. Paul, I looked up uh, I looked you up uh, and quite a few other experts. Or I looked up you and quite a few experts, and uh, next to maybe Stanton Friedman and Lauren, or Lorraine Warren, I couldn't find any paranormal expert with the experience you have. Uh, how do you keep your patience uh, with some of the, these guests? Guests, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, th- that's that's uh, not a very deep question, but I do appreciate it, Julie. It's. Uh I don't know. It does. I suppose it is kind of a disadvantage to have guests with whom you know, uh, and, and have more experience than than they do. Uh, but that's not something that can be helped. That's maybe I don't know. A lot of people ask us to do. The, they like these open line shows because well, we, only recently did the paranormal start becoming more uh, popularly accepted. Well, that's true. When I started out, there was no such thing as quote ghost hunting or all that nonsense that wasn't it didn't it didn't exist and people thought it was pretty strange 
And as a matter of fact, I got in all kinds of trouble in the seminary uh, for doing it. They didn't understand it. They didn't know what I was really up to, and uh, I wasn't doing anything I shouldn't have been doing, in my opinion, but uh, I nevertheless got got uh, got nailed. So uh, in any case, uh, I guess that, that's all about all I can say. We do the best we can. We really try to respect all the guests um, whom we have have on, and we, we do welcome all opinions. Uh, last night was a perfect example on our CBS edition, We uh, and we've even gotten some feedback on that already, which if, if we have time, we'll get to that, but... Uh, but again, you know, thank you for, uh, noticing that. And we do try to be patient with everyone and realize that, uh, you know, the, 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 the true measure of knowledge is realizing how much you don't know. And, uh, I, I like having our guests because I learn something, uh, maybe they do. And, uh, you know, you, you never stop learning. And, you know, no matter how much experience you have, you, I think the, the real measure of it is realizing how much uh, that, that you have not experienced and that you don't know. Right. So. Okay. So that's what we hope to achieve by having on yeah. people besides ourselves, because then it would just be boring if it was just us agreeing with each other the whole well, time. Well, there are guests so you have more experience than Ben. What do you mean? Sometimes. Well, you've been at this since 05. You were like 13 years old. Was I? Oh, wow. See, it's so long you can't even remember. Yeah, I, I don't even I don't even remember. All right. Well, anyway, uh, here's another one. This is about haunted places, and it's from Irene, also doesn't want her whole name used, in Danvers, Massachusetts. Right. Where the Salem witchcraft trials actually occurred, most of the most of them anyway. Alrighty, so Irene writes to us, "Hi Paul and Ben, uh, can a place be haunted but have no ghosts? We live in an old house, uh, more than three hundred uh, years old, and uh, there is a corner of one dun- downstairs room where a puddle is, or a puddle, puddle. I meant poodle, where a poodle is always barking." <laughs> uh, <laughs> barking puddle. I'd like to look uh, into that. Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's definitely odd. Um, we are worried about. Worried about him because it's like she is having uh, bad health uh, because of stress. Uh, we also feel presences in the house uh, sometimes, but nothing that really bothers us. It's like things can come and go from that corner. Hmm. You know, I hear that and I immediately think of that Providence case a few years ago. And Ben and I checked that out. And there was, it seemed to be a place very much like that. There was a location. As a matter of fact, there were there a couple of, I guess officially they're known as gargoyles, but they're works of art with faces on them or something that are known in Europe, and people put them in their gardens and things like that. And they were hanging in this basement. <clears throat> and that seemed to be where stuff was coming and going from. And the uh, the landlord called us in because it was everybody who would move into the house, no matter how successful or happy they were, their lives would be fried as soon as they lived in this house for all, according to the landlord. So I think that this might be that kind of situation. Hopefully your your uh, lives are going well, Irene. But it is possible, I've found, that you can have locations that are, I suppose you might call them portals in the parlance of that kind. And it's funny, especially corners sometimes, uh, it seems as though there are uh, energy is concentrated there. There could be a vortices, if, if they want to use that term, under the house. We find that in areas of high water tables with clay or sandy soil, uh, these areas are very uh, conducive to conducting, so to speak, electromagnetic fields that can do funny things with space and time. And, and we find can sometimes allow these things to come and go. What are these things? Well, uh, we hope not, but parasites. Uh, or you could have situations like this case in Connecticut that we're always talking about where anything can and does seem to pass through the house, usually without realizing that it's doing so and that people uh, who live in the house don't uh, always uh, aren't always noticed by these these entities, uh, which are of all kinds of different species, uh, n- nothing really negative so far. Uh, people are heard uh, talking, uh, non-people are heard uh, conversing apparently, things of strange footsteps, uh, odd creatures you wouldn't even be able to make up, uh, the, the, especially like the square ones dancing by the window, that kind of thing. Yeah, I still can't even get over <clears> that. Yeah, and so anyway, this is the kind of thing. So there are places where these things occur. So you can, I suppose, have a quote-unquote haunted place with no quote-unquote ghosts, if this is the scenario. So Sometimes things uh, sometimes things are just weird. Yeah. So. And, you know, I always say, Ben and I always, always tell people, if you feel uncomfortable in a certain place, especially if you're touring the area with a real estate agent, <laughs> don't buy it or rent it if you don't feel comfortable there. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, I, I totally agree with that. So anyway, that's uh, probably the best we can say. I mean, if anything gets uh, weirder, let us know. But I think at this point, you just have uh, one of those places. Uh, remember, it was funny, Ben. We were at Powderham Castle in England, one of our ancestral homes with our 
uh, cousin Lady Catherine, and she was tour showing us around. Ah, uh, yes. Including all the secret bookcases. And that was cool. I'd never seen that before. I didn't think that the the, the fake bookcase door things actually existed. I, I was except in Scooby Doo. That's all I could think exactly. of. Exactly. I felt like Shaggy. Well, all we needed was him. Well, you kind of look like Shaggy. But <laughs> I do. But but uh, the whole family apparently, unbeknownst to us, was taking bets about whether we would identify the quote haunted staircase at at the castle that we had never heard of. But it's funny. We got into the, di- the, the, the well, I call it the dish room, the china room uh, in the, the dish room, and I don't know, it was dish room to me. And I, I really, I, and I don't know if you did because we usually feel the same things. That's how you got involved in this in the first place. Was I wanted to see if blood relatives have the same reactions to places I'm just, like this. I'm just an experiment. Yeah, well, no, not anymore. No. I think I'm the experiment at this point. But we got into that dish room, and and everything seemed heavy and kind of, and you know, you picked that up. And uh, Lady Catherine kind of kind of looked at each other, you know. Then up 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 the stairs we went, and that was the the so called haunted landing on there. And even as kids, they didn't want to go in there and that kind of thing. So, um, I guess I guess we kind of got it got it right. Yeah. But it was it was. But I think there was something. But it was weird because out. the room under it it felt like really what's the word uh, moist. Yeah, like uh, and it, it like smelled like someone's bathroom, not like a bad. Well, smell. the place is seven hundred years old. Well, I'm just saying, but it was just that one room, and all the other rooms around it were fine. But this was like a room that was like it, you wouldn't expect it to be like moist and like humid, like a bathroom, because it had a bunch of dishes in it. it was, yeah, right. I was just like, this this doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I just thought that was weird. And that was like right near the stairway where we felt like kind of weird. And yeah, like, that's. That's odd. So that that sort of fits in with the high water tables and things like that. Well, that was that was the place, and uh, sure enough, I think uh, as you say, I, they are right next to the River X, right near the mouth of the River X. Oh yeah, uh, E X E, it's called, and uh, is the name of the river. Very, very ancient Saxon name uh, in near the town of Exeter in Devon and Torquay, where if you watch Faulty Towers, that's where that the famous British comedy. That's where that yes. supposedly occurred. But anyway, this is all in the, the, the county of Devon, and it is a very moist area. As a matter of fact, they had terrible floods recently. So it could be that you had a high water table, um, probably sandy soil, because it's not far from the sea, or the North Sea. I should say the um, uh, the, the ocean and that part of the country. So uh, all very possible that you have a situation where you've got a, a place where the energies are, are active in one particular spot in the house. Yeah. This being a rather big house compared with the one I'm sure that Irene lives in. But nevertheless, the principle is the same. It's the principle of the thing. Indeed. And if you ever see the movie Remains of the Day with Sir Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> uh, most of the interior scenes were from Powderham Castle. So check it out. Uh, absolutely a beautiful place. And one of our favorite places. Okay. And uh, so, oh, I also, one, one thing about Powderham Castle, too, there was a, in the annals of, of paranormal oddities, there was a, the, known as the Devil's Footprints in Devon, in the county of Devon, uh, 1888, or am I wrong? Maybe before that. But the, there were miles and miles of these strange footprints in the snow, and they seemed to be hoofed. And they, they were on two legs, not four, like a deer would be, because there are lots of deer around here. But and they were very large. Uh, but they were just 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 odd. It wasn't a horses, was and they they went from southern Devon through the grounds of Powderham Castle, started again across the River X, which is very wide at that point, and continued on for another several miles. And so uh, people just woke up and found that. So uh, we think of Powderham Castle. I thought of that while we were there. Hey, this is one of these. Uh, Locations, one of these weird things that is recorded in the annals of paranormal research. Of course, things do tend to get embellished over the years, but this is pretty well, uh, pretty well documented. Okay, we have. So I'm going to read this one. There's some of a reaction to our show last night, which was a little bit controversial. I think we might save that for our CBS Open Line show next week. And we have. Uh, <clears throat> this is one. Uh, since we're talking about this sort of thing, is about portals of the paranormal kind, and it is from Courtney in New York City. Alrighty, so Courtney writes to us. Uh, Love you, Paul and Ben. There is a lot to talk about uh, portals, and I have even heard you talk about them on Coast to Coast. Uh, I know parasites and other beings can come through them, and I hear you talk about escaping through them, but can people get stuck uh, in them without wanting to? And do you know about cases where that happened? Well, the answer is yes and yes, I'm sorry to say. 
when, when we're referring to portals, we're talking about perhaps what we were just talking about, areas where there is a great deal of energy and there can be some, what appears to be, for lack of a better term, coming and going between parallel worlds. There seem to be entities out there who could do that better than we can, but there are also situations where people have gotten, I think, for better, lack of a better term, sucked into these things. I spoke with some people in England who were witness to a situation where they were jogging along a country road and there was one of them who was leading, appeared to trip, fall to the roadway, disappeared in front of them all and was never seen again. There are situations where that are well recorded uh, throughout history where people disappeared in plain sight and appeared somewhere else or some when else in a way because there, there was missing time involved. And uh, there are situations like this, and I can only believe that these were the results of stumbling into or getting sucked into some sort of a portal, uh, if you want to call it that. And uh, the thing is, are these always in the same place? Well, maybe in the case of uh, Powderham Castle or Irene's house uh, that we were just reading about, uh, maybe they are in, in the same place for a while. Or uh, remember, the, any hydrologist will tell you that, that the uh, if we're talking about water tables, the water under your house, especially if you have a well, is never the same from one day to the next. It keeps moving. There are, as they call, underground rivers and streams and things. It's a dynamic system. So they can move. Uh, w- one example that I uh, really remember from my own experience, uh, not of disappearing, although uh, believe it or not, I have tr- <laughs> not tried that, but I have experimented with it, uh, was at the Score Hill Stone Circle, once again in England, and uh, many years ago I was there and I, I wanted to see the, the Stone Circle, which is a, a site uh, from prehistoric times. And as you may know, people from uh, that part of the world, and really, really all over the world, put up these stone circles uh, and use them either for worship or for calculating the stars or it depends who you talk to, what they were used for. But they are in what are commonly called sacred places, places where... The energies are really strange, and people felt weird or felt the presence of something divine or or just something weird, and uh, very often you can still feel it there. Score Hill is one of the areas where you can still feel something strange. Well, I remember when I was there, I was uh, I was by myself. Uh, ben wasn't even born yet, and it was uh, 1989, uh, a very austere English day in March out on the moors, in the vicinity of the area where Sherlock Holmes set the Hound of the Baskerville. So the, the uh, ambiance was wonderful for somebody who's interested in this stuff. And I happen to be standing there, and it's a very large wilderness area. There was a, was a farm sort of in the back, but there was a line of people who came out from behind. A, they call them tours, T-O-R-S, on Dartmoor. And these tours are rock outcroppings that are very strange. I've really never seen anything like it anywhere else in the world. Probably been, uh, when we were in Iceland, that looked a little bit like that landscape, but not quite the same. wasn't quite as volcanic. You mean like basically plain with random rock sculptures all over the place? Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. And very green, too. Uh. So out from one of these outcroppings, and it's difficult to judge distances. I know in the Arctic, in the desert, and in the areas of the moors, it's very difficult to judge distance. But it seemed to be about a quarter mile away from the size of the people. Out from behind this uh, tour came a line of people. Some were on horseback, some were on foot. And uh, call me crazy, but they sure the heck looked like they were in some kind of uniform. You're crazy. Thank you very much. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. You told, no, I you told, find that a relief in a way compared with some of the stuff I've actually experienced. Well, you've, you've t- <clears throat> you told me to call you crazy, so. Hey, call me. No, I'm, call just, me I'm just taking what you said literally. I was trying to make a joke. Yeah. Anyway, okay. continue. Anyway, okay. It's no good to have to explain it. But. <laughs> so in any case, uh, that's what I saw. But anyway, it's all in this circle, circle, and I could not uh, take a, an in-focus picture in this circle. And I stood with my back up against one of the, the largest of the stones, and uh, you know I got, felt kind of dizzy and all this kind of thing. But this is the sort of thing. And yet there are other stone circles that are very famous. Uh, like I've been to Avebury. You, you and your, uh, I, my, your older brother and I and mom have been to Avebury again before you were born. You missed all the fun. I missed stuff. all the fun. Stuff. You missed the chickens and all. And uh, it doesn't seem weird there at all um, because maybe the energy has moved because of the groundwater or the portal or whatever has moved or if it was a portal. So you just, you just don't know with these things. So this guy who fell and hit the pavement or di- fell and didn't hit the pavement, 
the portal may have been moving, caught him just right, may have been there because the, the others were around there. That nothing happened to them. And when I say I've experimented with this, I've been in areas where you've heard where there are strange sounds taking place. You can hear them coming from a certain location. I often cite the uh, in Pomfret, Connecticut, the Village of Voices, so-called. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, the laughing of the children or, or the ox cart going by that we couldn't see. Uh, I, I've done experiments in places like that where you, I've, I've run toward the sound, and you get to where you think it is, and, and it, all of a sudden it's just just over there, or it's just over there. And you really, you, it's like trying to find the end of the rainbow. You really can't find it. Although once I did, I found the, find the end of the rainbow. You look up, and there it was. And there's no gold or no leprechauns. But anyway, what are you going to do? You can't have it all. So, uh, again, a very strange situation with the portals. Uh, people write in all the time. I think I know where there is one. Well, it might not be there the next day. So uh, th- that's the answer to the question there, Courtney, and uh, take it or leave it. <laughs> okay. Here's a, i got a few more minutes here. Here's another one. This is from Cynthia P. in Oakland, California. Alrighty, so Cynthia writes to us. Hi, Paul and Ben. I really enjoy the show, and it makes me think. Uh, one thing I have uh, thought about is the psychic power of aliens. It seems that from the abduction stories we hear, they have uh, great psychic power over those they abduct. If psychic power is essentially uh, the same between species, uh, could we overcome their power in an abduction situation? If not, uh, why would our psychic power be weaker than theirs? Uh, Thanks, and keep up the good work. Well, it depends what kind of psychic power we're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about, like, uh, the PK or something like that, or psychokinesis? Yes. Yep. That. So stands for, yeah. yeah it, it, if we're talking about that, that's entirely different than, like, Freud's definition of, like, psychic power as in the power of the mind. Yeah. Um, uh, you know what I'm thinking of uh, is uh, the Reed case, the uh, Reed family abduction case from the 1960s. And we're going to have John, not John, John Reed, right? Uh, Tom Reed uh, on with uh, his lie detector uh, operator who tested him, uh, I believe it's next week on our CBS version. Um, oh no, that's so well, probably two. I, I don't know exactly when it is, but we just listen for the announcements. But the, his story was when he this first occurred to them, they lived on a farm in Massachusetts in the uh, 1960s, and they, they both went out. Uh, they were both, it was broad daylight, and a craft was on the ground and, in the field area near some trees. And uh, the, he and his brother were both taken into this craft, according to the story. And uh, the brother uh, tried to fight back. But uh, And I've heard of situations like that, but I have never heard of anyone actually succeeding in fighting back. But, of course, if, the, if they did succeed, if all this stuff is true, then it would be a matter of maybe you wouldn't have heard about it because the abduction might never have occurred. You know, the aliens might have backed off if, if that's what they are. Uh, I have a lot of suspicions about the whole abduction phenomenon. People assume these are people from other planets uh, coming here and doing experiments on people. Well, maybe that's true, but there are a lot of other possibilities. Uh, the whole Rendlesham Forest thing, if you uh, listen to the, the uh, renditions of uh, the story from uh, people like our good friends uh, Jim Penniston and John Burroughs, who actually touched – John actually uh, – I should say that Jim actually touched the craft – uh, one of them that had landed in Rendlesham Forest, 1980 U.S. Air Force personnel, uh, that they there was uh, uh, some kind of time travel going on, and that they were us, they were our remote descendants who were coming back as their DNA was failing or some other problem. So there are all kinds of scenarios here, but there universally there does seem to be some kind of, if you want to call it, psychic power that has uh, kind of t- taken over the situation and that is controlled by whoever this is. Uh, that we do not seem able to resist very well does seem to be a universal uh, dictum in this this scenario. But again, what it's about, I don't know. But I guess I guess the question really is: Have we ever heard of anyone who has successfully resisted this? And uh, the question, and the thing is, no. I, people have tried, but but they they have not. Um, one wonders if they're looking for certain genetic traits. Uh, the RB blood group, I guess, in the Reed case, because they all have that, which is kind of rare. Uh, I don't know. But uh, whether they're looking for people who might be strong, who might try and resist, they might be looking for that, or they might be looking for people who are sheep. I don't know. Uh, we just don't know. So I really would have to answer no to the question. Here, Here is one. Uh, actually, oh no, I'm going to save that because that's about last night's show. Okay. Uh, here is one from... Chandra in New York City. A lot of New York City people writing in tonight. 
Alrighty, so uh, Chandra writes to us. Hi guys, uh, there are some really uh, scary videos on YouTube about night crawls in California. Is this real? And what are these? Are they uh, multiverse people you like to are like you talk about? That's a really good question, Ben. You, you've you've seen that. You had some thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just thought it was interesting to look at because there's um. Actually, I forgot my thoughts on that. I did have thoughts, but the thoughts went away. Well, wh- what these night crawlers are, uh, they're not the type of fisher- fishermen would look for. They're, th- if you see the, the uh, videos, and there are some on YouTube, and of course, you know, you never know what's going to appear on YouTube. Uh, with all due respect, as uh, some of these things I'm sure are fake, but this uh, I have done some research on it, and uh, the opinion is that these seem to be legitimate. What what you see in these are nighttime shots from a security camera, in most cases in the vicinity of a certain area of California, I think it's central California, if I'm not mistaken, and you see whitish, actually white figures, which are almost like long legs and uh, then just a sort head. of a head. Yeah, yeah. And it, almost, it was like a Mothman kind of thing, although that was more... No, no, no uh, I don't think I could compare the two. No, I suppose not. Uh, and, and one shot I'm thinking of, uh, these things, one of them is walking, seems to be an adult, there seems to be a, a little one with it, uh, in, in the same configuration, just sort of walking nonchalantly down. Well, what's down. interesting is the, nat- the natives around there actually have totems of these things. You're right. I've seen photographs of the totems of these things. So apparently the, if this is a portal for, through which they're coming through, or we find sometimes these creatures don't even know that we're there, um, and they're just sort of mostly in their own world. Well, from what I read about it, apparently that video, the security camera thing, came from this uh, couple who owned – a house out there, and there were some like they would wake up every night to like sounds outside, and they thought they were um, like raccoons or something messing around in the trash or whatever, and like messing around in their backyard. So they decided to put up, or they thought it was like neighbor kids or something. Yeah. So they put up a security camera to see like what the commotion was about, and that's where that video came from. Are they, are they, okay, wow, that, that's so. I think, I think, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not. Don't quote me on that, but that's what I. That's the story I read. So you're suggesting the night crawlers may be engaged in foul play? Well, foul play would in. Uh, infer that they murder people. No. <laughs> well, no, so, so hopefully not. You get enough trouble. In they might be. They, they might be like yeah. horsing about, but I wouldn't say. So, so foul I think. So play. I think what we would do is I, we'd is, like to. We're yeah. looking right now for an expert on this subject. If there is such a person, maybe maybe a native, you know, who might know the history. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> have him on the show. See what uh, what's going on with that. And because uh, it's a typical kind of. It's a kind of thing you'd see at that case in Connecticut. Yeah, just sort of really odd and out there. But apparently, this has been happening for a while but the thing is how come we haven't heard about this before <laughs> i don't know well communication and information uh, flow isn't wasn't what it is today yeah true too. so but something like that you think would, would stand out but again then somebody knew about it because there are totems of that uh going on in that area that uh, can be seen at the national park so there we are okay well that's about all we have time for this evening as far as these emails are concerned so we will continue uh on our cbs show next sunday night in Seattle, Boston, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. So we'll give you information on that. So in the meantime, we encourage you to uh, uh, check out our website, BehindTheParanormal.com. You can find out lots about guests, past, present, and future, and about shows that are coming up. And you can get a link to our main site, NewEnglandGhosts.com, and that uh, tells you all about Ben and myself and what we're working on, different cases, and lots of lots of cool information, I would like to think, and articles about various things that we talk about on the show, including explaining the multiverse, if you can even do that, and that kind of thing, our weird point of view on all this. No, we could attempt to. We, we, we do try. We do try. We get a lot of good feedback on that. You can also subscribe to our quarterly newsletter, which is late. The winter one's late, probably because of all the snow. And you can even apply to become a reporter. Of the show. We have a bunch of show reporters, about 10 at this point, uh, different parts of the world. And uh, you can let us know what's going on with that regard. So we have nearly 450 free podcasts of our shows at BehindTheParanormal.com. Don't forget, they're all free, and they're all available there. That's right. And many thanks to our producer this evening, Ben himself. It's a real pleasure to have him with us. Usually he's not with us on Mondays now because of his school schedule. But Well, like I said, thank George Washington. Thank you, George Washington. Uh, next week, February 25th, we will welcome back our good friend Larry Warren for his take on some recent developments regarding the Rendlesham Forest UFO incidents in England, to which he was an eyewitness while serving in the U.S. Air Force. I don't think Larry has ever been on this edition of the show, as a matter of fact. All right, and on to our CBS edition, on February 24th, uh, 
my dad and I will take the hour to have another open line show. Uh, we leave you this evening with a thought from the great American author and philosopher Khalil Gibran. Life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. Oh, well, we still have about maybe 30 seconds, so... Count it down. All right. Count, yeah, let's just count down the last, the last <laughs> few seconds of the show. Just well, with that, I want to thank everyone for for writing in this evening. And thanks to people in. who called in. That was absolutely. Yeah, that was, was great. That was a treat. Yeah, that was great. But uh, Paul at behindtheparanormal dot com or Bennett behindtheparanormal dot com or the website itself has a form you can fill out uh, to uh, let us know what you're thinking and what your questions are. All right. So that that about wraps it up for us. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.